Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this edition of Chelsea Green Publishing's Practical Skill Sharing Webinar Series. Today, we are lucky to have Trad Cotter, author of Organic Mushroom Farming and Micromediation. Trad is a microbiologist, professional mycologist, and organic gardener who has been tissue culturing, collecting native fungi in the southeast, and cultivating both commercially and experimentally for more than 22 years. Trad and his wife Olga own and operate Mushroom Mountain Farm in South Carolina with their daughter Heidi. The presentation will run for about 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer period. Please put your questions into the chat box and Trad will do his best to answer them at the end of the presentation. Thank you for being here, Trad. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, I've got a lot of slides, so that's my style. I'm just gonna go ahead and get started and not waste any time. Um, you see that? And uh, first of all, you know, if we gaze deep, deep into nature, we'll find the solutions for everything. Uh, I believe that uh, that's a very good quote. That was from Albert Einstein. And that's the way that I, I flow and think every day when we wake up. It's a good idea to go out mushroom hunting if you've never been. Uh, join a mushroom club. Uh, learn what mushrooms are around you. Uh, we do teach ID classes um, or join the club uh, that's near you. And there's thousands of different mushrooms out there in the wild. That's Olga uh, picking wild mushrooms, uh, oyster mushrooms when we first met. And what's really cool about mushrooms and mushroom hunting is that uh, some mushrooms are really small. You've been walking by them, you don't notice them. But once you start studying mushrooms, um, they're just, they're everywhere. They're all around you. And it seems like they just pop out of the background literally popping out of the background. That's a very large morel mushroom from our area. And uh, there is a chapter in the book about uh, morel cultivation, which is experimental. And uh, also these, these are giant macrocybe titans. These are in the Southeast and also in the tropics. But this is a very large edible mushroom that weighs about 50 pounds. And honestly, this is a small one. So I have the pleasure of trying to cultivate these in the Southeast, but this is wild. So you never know what you're gonna find. Mushrooms come in all different shapes, colors, and sizes, um, but the fact is they do synthesize light and the color, uh, they have a predisposition to produce different things. Um, vitamin D is one of them, the only non-animal source of vitamin D. And that's depicted here in two clones. That one was grown in the dark on the left and one was on the right. So the one on the right is full of vitamin D and the one on the left is not. So um, the quality of your mushrooms also is reflected about uh, the environment that you grow them in. So where do mushrooms come from? Mushrooms produce spores, they don't produce seeds. Um, they also um, germinate and then they mate. They form mycelium, which is like spawn. And uh, the spawn, uh, this mushroom, uh, uh, mycelium takes over the environment, then it produces another mushroom, and then it produces spores here to be re-released. To uh, identify a mushroom, you can take a, a spore print, uh, put a, take a mushroom, put it on aluminum foil, and wait a couple hours, and then you can match this up with your field guides. Very important step in mushroom identification. As a laboratory at Mushroom Mountain, we take the spores, we germinate them like you see here, and then they radiate out in a beautiful symmetrical pattern. Um, one of the other things we're gonna talk about at the end is medicinal mushrooms, but this shows you a fungus attacking a fungus. I think it's fascinating. And um, it's normally symmetrical and then it gets asymmetrical. And then what you see is this surge of mycelium and then these uh, tiny little droplets of enzymes. So mushrooms produce heat, carbon dioxide, and they sweat water and they swim through that sweat, uh, digesting things in their pathway, even a competitor. And when you zoom in, you see this uh, very target specific. So this was something the mushroom dialed up and this is what happens in nature. Uh, they're kind of self-cleaning and disinfecting as they go. And I think that that's just fascinating. Also in those droplets are the enzymes. So it's almost like our stomach fluid. So um, they're digesting and breaking down things in the, in the environment and they're absorbing nutrition right through their cell walls. Uh, mush some mushrooms have a very high tensile strength mycelium, just like spider webs. You know, some spider webs are very uh, faint and frail and others are really strong when you hit your face in the woods <laughs> and you freak out. Um, 
But this is King Strafaria. That has 20 to 30,000 times its weight. Uh, this is one you can grow in the garden. That's a great mushroom to grow in the garden. And also turkey tail, the, the very common turkey tail uh, bracket fungus that's all over the, the world. Uh, has a tensile strength of over uh, 500,000 times its weight in mycelium. But um, what we discovered is uh, on vacation, my mom found a mushroom in Key West, Florida, that's Neolentinus tigrinus. Um, and that was uh, photographed by Vangolis. So I have to give credit uh, to Wikipedia there. Uh, but it was a very similar situation um, near salt water. So this is a very salt tolerant uh, strain that we acquired. And it had a uh, tensile strength of 800,000 to 1 million times its own weight. So it's an edible mushroom, but it's very tough. And we're trying to think of other uses for it. So what we did was uh, we went to the National Brick Research Center here at Clumsy University, and we mixed that fungus in with uh, clay. And they let us use their machines. And uh, we mixed it in with the clay here and uh, very professionally done with their hydraulic presses. We made uh, over 400 or 500 bricks. And here they are here. There's my little girl, Heidi. She helped out here. She see she was stacking them on the pallet. And what's interesting about these is we don't have to kiln dry these. Uh, they naturally air dried and um, they produced what we're calling living bricks. So you see the mycelium running through. Uh, and what we're hoping for is to develop these into bricks that are uh, that can stay alive for a year, and they could uh, be dipped in water. Uh, they can live up to a year without water. So we can dip these and then stack them and form a living mortar. So it's a carbon negative brick. And it is also, um, hopefully will um, be no need for mortar. So this would be a great building tool um, in developing countries where people can grow mushrooms for food and mix the mycelium in and build a house with uh, almost for free. And so we took our bricks here. You see Olga and the girls, uh, Olga and Olga's sister and Kat, our office manager, building a, uh, a, a pizza oven at Mushroom Mountain. And we stacked, um, this is myceliated clay here as well in the cob mix. And um, this is uh, the bricks that we made in, in the, the National Brick Research Center. So a little bit about micromediation. I'm just gonna to touch on some subjects really quickly. And uh, mushrooms are really good. I showed you biological, and that'll also play into uh, medicinal compounds as well, if they're producing their own antibiotics. But what about their ability to break things down? Uh, mushrooms produce non-specific enzymes that are able to break down very complex uh, molecular structures, such as man-made uh, compounds, hydrocarbons, chlorinated compounds, uh, benzene rings. Um, they use oxygen and uh, peroxidase enzymes to kind of just bust those Legos apart. And uh, here, here's an experiment we did years ago. This one was in the book. Uh, this is my favorite one because it was one of our first. And this is a mushroom eating atrazine. That's three times. This is an, a very nasty herbicide that's getting into our drinking water. And it sat on this plate for 10 days, which it normally would just outrun in about five. So it was very toxic. And what's interesting is from day 10 to 12, it figured it out. So we need a little bit of time to dial up the right enzymes, the right chemical keys to break these molecules apart. And there's nothing else but atrazine in that gel. That's what's fascinating is that they can harvest molecules for their own metabolism. And we've got motor oil here. We started doing motor oil in the gels and then they started to eat that. Uh, these are oyster mushrooms, so they're omnivores. And then uh, with the high tensile strength mycelium, we start thinking about water filtration. So uh, right now we're mixing uh, uh, the tiger solgill, neolentinus tigrinus with sand, with biochar, perlite, lightweight media, so we can make a living micron filter that one could filter water through um, off the grid, which I think is really cool. And they stun and kill the bacteria and sometimes use them as a food source. Uh, we've got a, a relative here of the same Lentinus tigrinus and also the shiitake uh, is Lentinula, but Len Neolentinus lepidius um, grows on pine or conifer stumps, but it can also break down treated lumber. So it's a great opportunity 
to understand uh, at construction sites, maybe there's a lot of treated wood or treated wood waste or railroad construction waste um, where we might be able to compost this stuff and make it inert and safe again for the soil. <clears throat> as far as recycling aids, uh, there's a lot of this stuff around you at the moment. If you, uh, we finish this lecture and you go looking around your house or your farm, you notice a lot of debris, uh, you may recycle it. Uh, honestly, I live in the South, a lot of people burn it and it's a shame because you can grow mushrooms on it. Uh, recycled jeans, anything that's made of cotton or cellulose, uh, oyster mushrooms are a great candidate for this. Uh, old pizza boxes um, are covered with grease and cheese and they're not recyclable, but mushrooms like pizza too. So you can fill these boxes with shredded paper, uh, coffee grounds, things like that, and then grow mushrooms right out of the pizza boxes. The fact is that 30 to 40% of household waste is suitable for mushroom growing and 60 to 80% of a business. So what that could do is shift the uh, flow of material to the landfill, which is huge. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is be zero waste as a society. Um, that should be our end goal. And honestly, we all know it, that um, we need to make that decision. It's going to eventually happen. We can't keep producing waste. Uh, nature knows no waste. You know, why should we? And um, this is coffee grounds here. You can start a bucket with a little bit of oyster mushroom spawn. You sprinkle it in and produce mushrooms right at home. So try composting with mushrooms at home. Very easy. Uh, Completely different subject are mycopesticides. These are fungi that attack living insects while they are alive. Uh, I'm fascinated by these. Um, these are some that I found. This is a, a cicada nymph that was buried in wood. I mean, you could see how small that is. And that was the only thing that was exposed above the soil. Uh, Olga found this one. It's a scale insect. And when she found it, it only had a couple tiny bumps. And I told her that was not normal. So we put it in a jar of water and out came these little antlers here. And that's the fungus coming out of the scale. Now, scale insects are a huge problem in gardens and in the ornamental industry. Uh, fruit trees, uh, ornamental plants, um, anywhere uh, around the world. And there it is sporulating on auger. You can see it turns back into a mold and now it's looking for a new host. It's looking for the next scale insect. So we find these, people mail them, they find them and turn it in. And um, Olga found this one. You see this one. This is a wasp with a mushroom growing out of its neck right below its uh, thorax here. So everybody, if you're at home watching, push on that little soft space right there and tell me how it feels. Imagine a mushroom coming out of there tonight. Uh, what a way to go. What a way to go. Anyway, um, this one was behind our house here in South Carolina. Uh, this is an ant and it's biting into a branch. This one infects the ant, drives the ant up the tree, and then makes it bite into a branch, and then it kills the ant, and then the mushroom pops out the back of its brain, and then it shoots down uh, spores upon uh, the rest of the colony. It actually lines up with the pheromone-laden superhighway that the rest of the ants are using, which is just crazy. Um, almost like it's a dirty bomb placed in a very accurate position. And why would a fungus do that? Um, well, I tell you why we would want to do that and take advantage of it because uh, myco uh, pesticides kill everything on just about everything and including us uh, getting into the groundwater, uh, beneficial insects. But what if we could collect these insects and uh, find very specific strains for each little insect that could be problematic, um, including beneficial insects and organisms? Why not target specific fungi for problematic insects, invasive insects? Um, this is, the facts are, just this one ingredient here, uh, seven and a half billion pounds are used, hit the U.S. soil every year, and a lot of that gets into the groundwater, and honestly, a lot of it hits non-target organisms. There's a lot of peripheral damage from these uh, compounds. And as much as, uh, we could lose as much as uh, 40 to 40 percent of all insects within the next 15 to 20 years, uh, we need a new plan. So um, the mold exists uh, here. It exists in nature as a mold, but when the right insect host comes along, it either eats it or it sticks to its armor like the cuticle, and then it mummifies it, and then a mushroom pops out of its body. 
not all of them produce a mushroom. Some of them do this. Uh, this was an uh, insect. We reinfected with a, uh, a fungus that we found on a black carpenter ant. And so we started collecting living carpenter ants and had to reinfect them to make sure we had the right pathogen. Uh, then uh, we took these fungi and, for instance, this is an example, we took these gels and made these little fire ant farms and such. Um, and within three to five days, we found that some of these strains completely mummified uh, the red imported uh, fire ants within three to five days, which is a huge problem. Uh, that's a five to eight billion dollar a year um, profit from, for the pesticide companies and, uh, and also in damages, uh, medical damages, agricultural damage. Um, so we're looking to work with this a little bit more. And uh, this is the way the fire ant kind of looks. It's biting into some fruit there that I was feeding it, but it didn't help. Uh, anyway, that's the way um, a fire ant should look, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, it does a lot of damage here in the southeast. And it is moving north with the climate change. It's moving north, coming soon to a town near you. And why is that important that we could find a mushroom or a fungus growing on an insect? Um, we might be able to go after some of these invasive exotic pests like the longhorn beetle, uh, the emerald ash borer, which is killing a lot of the ash trees. Um, and really the only remedy is to just spray, spray, spray. I mean, that's what the companies are telling you. That's what the pesticide companies want you to hear. Uh, when in reality, we can find something that's more target specific. Uh, this is MET 52. Uh, this is a fungus that you can buy, I believe now, MET-52, if you look up that online. Uh, but it's active against varroa mites that hitchhike on bees and also on brown spotted ticks. So it might be something good to put on your uh, pets because it's totally non-toxic to animals. Uh, we did have, uh, after lecturing up in Pennsylvania, uh, a woman uh, uh, turned me on to the spotted lanternfly, which is if you're in the Northeast, you're probably worried about this one. This is the uh, biggest threat to agriculture in the United States is seen since the early 1900s. So look up spotted lanternfly. Um, and luckily we had um, uh, someone turn these in. This is Tori Richards. And she, she drew, found a couple of these in Pennsylvania in ground zero. And she found a bunch of these and drove them down to South Carolina. So we've been cloning these insects. Uh, it's very target specific for this lantern fly. And this is what they look like on the other side. Uh, some are on the trees, some are on the ground. And what we do is we find these bugs, even if you just find one, that's what's exciting, is that you can take this, um, I put it in a blender, and then spray it back on, on a few individuals and then collect those. Say so you collect 10 or 20 more. And then you collect all those uh, and put those in a blender with some powdered sugar and then uh, sift out the body parts. This is what I do on Friday nights. <laughs> and um, then you've made your own mycopesticide. Uh, we, we do have an in-depth uh, workshop online. I'll talk about that later, about how to do this process. Um, it's, it's, um, I think it's fascinating and I think the timing is right considered all the insects that we're about to lose. So then you just take that powder, mix it with, with water and it's very target specific for those insects on these branches, meaning it, it uh, won't infect the, uh, the honeybees, the butterflies. It'll just go after that particular type or related leafhopper, which is a huge benefit. Um, we could also, uh, you could also take fungi like that. Uh, let's say the, the lanternfly fungus soak seeds in it or inject it into the plant, and then it becomes a part of the plant. Uh, it exists as a, what's called an endophyte. So the, the lantern flies are now eating vineyards and orchards in the Northeast. Uh, they were eating the tree of heaven, and now they've uh, gone to the wild grape. Now they're eating the cultivated grapes. So vineyards are being wiped out uh, literally within weeks. This is what an endophyte looks like. So imagine if um, we had our seeds soaked with a novel mycopesticide and then the fungus uh, picks up that pesticide because it wants it in its leaves because it's protecting that plant and then it carries that fungus forward get this to the seed so it actually brings that fungus into the seed and then when you plant the seeds harvested from that plant um, you will not have to inoculate it again so these are uh, the plant is inoculating itself 
and, and that's why seed saving is so important. It's no wonder that heirloom seeds do so well because we're also getting the fungal endophytes that are generations old. Uh, as far as human health, uh, these are neurons and some fungi are really good um, at preventing um, late stage Alzheimer's. This is uh, Ophioglossoides. It's, they change names all the time. Um, and this is a cordyceps mushroom that attacks deer truffles um, down here, false truffles. Re real truffles don't have a, a rind like this, but they found, uh, they did um, mice and rat studies and found that this uh, reversed the um, uh, gray matter loss in Alzheimer's patients, ultimately reversing Alzheimer's, but um, with really good numbers, not 100%, um, but uh, a very positive case. Now that one's hard to find, but what's an easy mushroom to find that does the same thing is a lion's mane mushroom. All right, lion's mane is a pom-pom, it's an edible that tastes like lobster and crab meat, and it shows very high activity, meaning um, it has nerve growth factor, herbicinones, and uh, erinacines that protect and help redevelop or regrow adult brain stem cells, which is fascinating. <clears throat> so here at Mushroom Mountain, we also study uh, pathogens, and uh, this is a uh, staph, and um, this particular one um, I collected out of my uh, nasal cavity. That's how a lot of researchers collect strains. So this is my personal staff collection <laughs> here. I also ordered staff, salmonella, uh, E. coli, um, strep throat, and pneumonial cultures uh, just to play with. It was my, my birthday present. So the problem is that, um, and you see this on the news, every other week is that drug resistance. You see that drugs can take uh, an FDA approved fractions, patented drug can take uh, 12 and a half to 14 years to discover, develop, um, run through trials and all this. The problem with that is that once that hits the market, then they become uh, drug resistant very quickly and uh, typically within two and a half years. And that's me talking today. Uh, next year, it could be a year and a half and the year after that, so uh, these bacteria are becoming multi-drug resistance, which is scary. And uh, this is totally resistant, you see here. And this is um, the strain before it's mutated into MRSA, which is methicillin resistant staph. Now it's, that's actually resistant to clindamycin. And we find mushrooms all the time. This is uh, chicken of the woods. Some of you might've heard of this mushroom. And uh, this is a very common mushroom across North America. But we found this mushroom, uh, it's just an, as the name suggests, sulfurous. It's very high in sulfur, and uh, sulfur based drugs for staph are showing a lot of promise. So, this one has, a, uh, has the ability to program itself to produce a novel uh, antibacterial compound kind of wrapped around those, the, uh, those sulfur atoms. So, it gives it that backbone that the, the MRSA does not like. And what we've done here is um, just with common conks and things that you might pass by every day. Uh, this is Foamy's Fomentarius. Um, what we've done, and this is in the book too, if you want an interesting read. Uh, and we've been proved upon this method. This is an old prototype, so we can show them today. Um, we made a little wells uh, of compressed mycelium. Then we injected, um, for this one, it was E. coli. So this was an easy training wheels exercise. And then within 24 hours, it browned, oxidized, and produced all of this metabolite. And um, these are five controls uh, deep and five replicates. So it was very consistent. And then we pulled out the metabolites, which was the mushroom dialing up a novel antibiotic for the trigger, which is really cool. This is uh, a metabolite made from maitake. So then we just started experimenting with all our mushrooms, uh, different styles of bags, uh, and designs and um, water reservoirs and pathogens, uh, uh, self-healing ports, things like that. But the whole idea is that why, why are we taking these broad spectrum, non-specific antibiotics when really the future could be that you could go into a hospital or a healing center, let's say, and get a biopsy or a culture. And what if we could inject that into uh, a specific mushroom culture or pure culture and the mushroom produce a novel um, medicine or novel antibiotic for each patient that walks in the door. That's kind of like what we're working on now. And it's the most fascinating. 
uh, um, that shiitake scored actually pretty high on staph, that's Staphylococcus aureus, and, uh, but it did not do the best. And chicken of the woods uh, did the best, along with jack-o'-lantern, but jack-o'-lantern is a poisonous mushroom, so that's kind of where we hit the wall on that one on where to go. <clears throat> but for now, it's chicken of the woods. Uh, we also do susceptibility testing. These are antibiotic discs that are sold uh, on the market. And then um, tetracycline and things like that. You can see these are the mushroom discs here spaced out. And what we're doing is comparing inhibition zones based on what they do. Um, we do uh, inhibition zones with uh, galleries and also quorum sensing. So this is two bacterial colonies, one shiitake fungus, and you see this big, huge uh, inhibition zone. And this is where the bacteria meet here. All the whites you see are dead E. coli here. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, um, just like the cuticle, like I said, mushrooms are not photosynthetic, but they are like uh, solar panels. The reishi mushroom um, takes two to three months to mature, but look how red that is. So it's just loaded with medicine. And what we do is make extracts. These are chaga extracts, and here are reishi extracts. We blend them up in ethanol. And uh, there are some formulas for these in my book that you can follow along with. Uh, to make your own extracts. Now, um, I do go out of the country quite often, um, down to uh, Haiti and down to um, Jamaica. Here's Haiti, Dominica, and Republic, and then here's Jamaica here. So we've been setting up a lab here, and now I think we're going down to Costa Rica down here next. Uh, two and a half years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting the Minister of Agriculture in Jamaica, and they're really excited to get mushroom grows on the island, and um, I was excited to be there. But while I was there, someone said, hey, what about magic mushrooms? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he said, well, they're legal here, or they're, they're not illegal. So we checked, it, uh, we checked with some uh, attorneys, and we got permission to set up a lab there. So the last one and a half to two years, we set up labs. Um, and uh, this is the molecule. Uh, it's very chemically similar to uh, your normal brain chemistry, the serotonin. It's a short-term metabolite, meaning it's non-toxic. There's no LD50, meaning lethal dose for psilocybin. Um, these, it, this is what the mushroom looks like. It's got black spores, and typically this is cubensis. There's many different species uh, worldwide. There's over 160 different species. Uh, but if, if it's a black staining, uh, blue bruising mushroom and it's gills, then it's probably going to contain psilocybin here. Um, these are even dried. You can see the blue bruising reaction. And one of the things it does, um, I highly recommend listening to or reading uh, Michael Pollan's book, uh, How to Change Your Mind, and also going to MAPS, uh, Multidisciplinary Approach for uh, Psychedelic Studies. That's... Uh, that involves uh, turning off the default mode network, which kind of is your uh, firewall for your brain and allows you to access um, and reprogram your brain in dealing with things like depression, anxiety, PTSD, addictions, OCD. Um, check with John Hopkins University. Also, there's some YouTube videos uh, with Roland Griffiths that are really good to watch. So listen for a podcast for um, Michael Pollan. And this is Olga here, we're cultivating uh, Cubensis down in Jamaica on the east side. It's a lot of fun. Can't do that in the U.S. yet. I mean, they've decriminalized it in a few cities uh, for personal use, but as far as cultivation for sale, it's uh, still a federal offense, Schedule 1. Uh, and that's what's beautiful about these is that they're non-toxic, um, it's non-addictive, and um, it, does have ha uh, it does have medicinal properties to it which completely contradicts the classification of Schedule 1. So I would like to see this moved out of Schedule 1 into probably 3 or Schedule 3 or even uh, completely legal. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Here's another beautiful shot of those, bruising blue. Those are taken by Olga down in Jamaica. And I always say, you know, what's, what's wrong with uh, um, unconditional love here. Here's Heidi hugging chickens down here. And when she was over in Jamaica, it was just amazing. And, and I think that it's something that society could use at this time, especially with the 
uh, all the resonance uh, and the uh, isolation uh, comes a lot of psychological um, concern and problems uh, that need to be fixed. So uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of psilocybin questions after this talk is over. But I just wanted to say that we're working on things. Um, this is um, uh, this is my CAT scan after I came back from Jamaica, and it just shows you the inside of my brain with mushrooms here. And this is completely normal. So if your CAT scan looks like this, congratulations. <laughs> but I also want to say that um, you know I've been studying mushrooms for 26, 28 years. I lost count. Um, and it's, it's like a Rosetta stone, you know, there, there, there's a language and by getting out into the woods and hunting mushrooms and finding cordyceps mushrooms growing out of the brains of insects, you know, they're telling me something, they're telling me a story, but they're also giving me inspiration to do things, uh, in my life, in my business and for people on the planet. And, um, if we can just decipher what they're trying to tell us. Um, we can be creative with that knowledge and uh, let them help us. You know, I, I said on another podcast, ask not what you can do, for, uh, no, mushrooms can do for you, but what you can do for mushrooms. That's my presidential pitch officially. You know, and I, I love doing this. I love cutting out shapes, but it's more than just cutting out shapes and making uh, hearts. It's, it's, it's knowing that these, these organisms uh, want to heal the planet and they're looking at us to help. Uh, we're very destructive organisms, and if they can teach us, even if it's through the ways of um, psilocybin or uh, meditation, things like that, that we could bond with the organisms rather than try to hurt them uh, and work together. Uh, and what's cool about this is watching that mycelium grow. You can uh, grow love, uh, just like Heidi's experiencing here. Uh, we're rescuing puppies in Jamaica that were abandoned. And, you know, um, I have a very high hopes for our next generation. This generation is looking for change. And I think that if we have hope, we uh, love, we, we can cultivate peace, you know. And, you know, what's wrong with hugging trees? You know, that shouldn't be derogatory. And I think that uh, once you start, uh, once we can, as a civilization, get back to nature, and uh, heal each other, heal ourselves, heal our enemies, uh, uh, feed everyone, uh, clean water, uh, good shelters, all that. We all deserve that. Um, but we really, really got to sew this back together. And I have a strong conviction that mushrooms can help all of this. So if we have love and peace, I know that we can have happiness together <laughs> all over the planet. Um, I think my time's about up. Whoops. Um, I do have um, so, this Mushroom Mountain University online. Sorry about that. Um, let me go out there. I don't know if I can mute that. But anyway, um, here's the book here. And I know that um, Chelsea Green will put in another plug for it here. But I also want to direct you to, to if you are, are looking for us or contact or need spawn or anything. Uh, it's my shameless self-promotion moment. <laughs> But uh, you can go to Mushroom Mountain. Um, we also have Mushroom Mountain University there. Um, you can look up courses on, on many different cool things. But um, courses are being posted, I'll be honest, probably next week, which would be um, July of, uh, let's say by July 20th, you'll be able to find some, some really cool courses on there on remediation, uh, mycopesticides, uh, making your own with normal kitchen equipment, um, four ways to grow mushrooms. Uh, you've got um, indoor cultivation, outdoor laboratory, mushroom identification, um, all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's good using uh, cold water, um, either soaked for a week, which can get pretty nasty, uh, anaerobic fermentation. Um, I've had a couple of interns quit over it because it's so gross. Um, it works okay, um, but lime pasteurization works good too. You just have to make sure that it's pH stable before you dispose of it, before you, um, you know, just have to acidify it before you dispose. Yeah, start small. Um, 
Uh, I consult for small growers, large growers, and the biggest mistake is to just go big and go in head first. So um, yeah, the buckets are good. Just drill the holes and pre-drill them and pack the stuff in there and stack them up and uh, learn from them. Um, do, do a couple buckets a week and, and let them teach you what they want for that space. You just kind of have to um, become the mushroom, so to speak. And um, it'll tell you mushrooms grow so quickly that they, you can learn from their physical appearance what they need and what they want. So good luck. I don't know. Um, I think what you'll see is decriminalization and not legalization um, because there's a lot of money. Uh, pharmaceutical companies have already invested in treating it like a drug. So um, I don't believe you're going to be seeing it for sale anywhere. It's still going to be black market, um, which can still get you in trouble. So if you're cultivating it for sale, um, I, I, I honestly am skeptical about that, about the power of lobbying, uh, that will, um, now I, I'm hopeful and opt optimistic about it, but I'm also optimistic that it won't work. <laughs> then, uh, unfortunately now what we could see is, um, um, people with licenses that are growing and selling to, um, what I would call a uh, manufacturer and distributor, I mean, the dis distributor could be a therapy or a healing center, and they would have the authority to uh, dispense those through, um, through that therapy, uh, therapeutic business. But they're still um, trying to patent and do all these things with uh, uh, psilocybin through the FDA. And I would look at a company called Compass, and I'm not gonna pick on them, and, and finger wag, <laughs> especially, uh, especially on this platform. But um, I would look into it for yourself and look up Compass and uh, see what they've got going on. And they've got some patents that are uh, a little bit eyebrow raising and I, I would think would be a concern. I, I think psilocybin is very important. It's medically important. Um, it's 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 going to have the ability to shift people away from the pill a day, um, anxiety and depression drugs that they're caught up in. It doesn't heal the problem. Um, I, I, psilocybin is going to be huge. It's going to be bigger than they say. It's going to be bigger than the ganja, the marijuana industry. It's going to be big, big business, and that's why a pharmaceutical is um, investing in it. And um, the other thing is, I think, is these novel antibiotics that we're looking into is um, if we, you know, we're a small company, and don't get me wrong, we don't, we don't think small. Um, we're thinking larger. So um, we're hoping we can look into those. But I think that um, our, our strategy for 50, 70, 80 years has been to purify things. But you know, and then patent them, whereas the, the organisms figure it out too quickly because it's a very easy hurdle to evolve around. And what mushrooms do is they dial up these beautiful uh, cocktails or suites of compounds that are synergistic that make it very difficult for these organisms to evolve, uh, to become drug resistant. So I think that, um, I mean, I just looked at the news. Uh, I look at it every day. Unfortunately, I got to know what the world's, what's going on, but um, I mean, they've found a new strain of bubonic plague. They've got a new strain of swine flu. I mean, all of this is in the last week. It's like how much more can um, civilization take? Um, but I think it is a symptom of a lot of things. It's the way of life. It's the crowded lifestyle. Um, it's health. It's diet. It's pesticide use. It's insects. And it's everything. Um, I think that the cards, the house of cards is starting to, starting to fall. Um, but I'm, I am uh, optimistic that as a society, you know, mushrooms can be a part of that solution. And I'm, I am biased enough to say that mushrooms will be the solution. <laughs> <laughs> I 
can't, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say anything about it. I always say that I've outlined a second book and um, I, um, like my advisor said at school, he goes, you're not a procrastinator, you're an incubator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it's not that I'm not working on it, it's uh, we are chipping away um, with projects to fulfill the table of contents of the vision that I have for the next one. Mm -hmm. In other words, I, I write a table of contents um, and a lot of the things that either haven't been done or it's something I want to know about that I think um, civilization needs to know about. And if it's not done, it takes a long time to put that plan together to fulfill the, um, to fulfill the, the, um, the goals of, of the chapters. And, um, and that's how we wrote the first one. So if you were happy with the first one, um, I would just say if, if I can get a little bit of free time, um, uh, to compose those uh, chapters. Uh, the long-term question around the shortcut would be, I would want to say within the next year and a half, two years, definitely delivered. Um, but I, my, my hopes are just to try to turn in a manuscript with, uh, within the next year, within this year, by the end of the year. And then it's in the hands of you guys, Brianne and, <laughs> editing takes a long time guys you know and i would i owe a lot of um credit to chelsea green for cleaning up my manuscript <laughs> uh so uh we're still experimenting with that um it's it's very strain specific so you can't use it with oyster mushrooms or you know, just any, any fungus, uh, you really have to find a high tensile strength uh, fungus that's there. Um, I mean, I know our strain would work there. Um, Neolentinus degrinus grows there and it has to, um, especially in the tropics. Um, um, and it's a fast growing fungus. So you have to find a fungus that's high tensile strength, uh, fast growing. And uh, what we did was just mix it in with um, clay and compress it and let it sit in the shade um, for a couple weeks. Now, it's not gonna be as water resistant as a brick, so you just have to paint it and, and that's it. But a carbon negative brick is a big deal. So uh, we're still working on it, it's a work in progress, but I would encourage you to, you know, that's, that's one of the things that's gonna be in the new book, you see? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a hundred plus of those things uh, scattered through four sections of um, I think ideas that we want, we're still chasing those rabbits, you know, mm -hmm. and we hope to have the final conclusion, meaning the recipe for those things in there. That depends on the, um, the water flow and the pressure. Um, and that's probably understandable. The, um, you can use lower tensile strength if it's just a kind of a seep, you know, off of a farm or a pond. But if you've got water flow, um, like we're working on one with this uh, city here that's got a substantial parking lot runoff. And if you don't have high tensile strength, the, the initial blast is just going to blow it out. And then you have the wood chips are gone. Uh, so uh, we, we use metal cages. We're using high tensile strength uh, mixed with sand and stuff like that. Um, it makes it more like, more like a, uh, gives it plasticity to, it welds it together. The water can flow through it and it's still there after a high water flow. So we're testing water flow rates uh, with that and different wood chip to sand mixtures to see how it can flow through there. Yeah, and, uh, and if, if you don't have my book, there is a whole chapter on fungi in the classroom on page 151. <laughs> I've memorized that. Uh, and it's because a lot of teachers and homeschool um, parents came to me and said, where is all this information after a tour? We really want to teach this um, to the next generation. Uh, yeah, I would start there. Um, there's a lot of cool little lesson plans in there that you can work on uh, with your son or daughters. And uh, yes, we are going to post some classes based on those little chapters in the book. So it's a play along of um, 
kind of the using the book as a text fungi in the classroom uh, being the classes online like how to how to do that um, I've got a lot of projects under my belt so uh, next week are more of the adult classes that are going to be posted and then after that I'll um, my goal is to get classes up there for schools and universities of all age groups you know stuff for kindergarten um, all the way up to postdoc okay. Funny, I, I just got out of a phone call <laughs> uh, this morning about a community garden and an indoor grow, and I asked them if they were nonprofit, and they said no, they were an LLC. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I haven't seen, I've seen some down in, I want to say New Orleans. Um, that was a couple years ago. I've kind of lost touch with them, but no, I haven't, I haven't been in contact with anyone or, or any knowledge. That's not to say it can't be done. The challenge is up keeping that, um, having the volunteers uh, tend to those, uh, having someone fully in charge and having volunteers tend to that. But I, I do believe it can work. Um, maybe a small greenhouse and some oyster mushrooms are the way to go. Uh, garden mushrooms are too seasonal, um, but th not to say you shouldn't include them. I would still include King Strafaria and maybe almond portobello in the summer or things like that and learning how to compost with fungi. Even making soil with fungi can help because they've, they've done something. They've made a huge contribution to the garden without producing mushrooms themselves mm -hmm. for sale. But when they do pop up, you know, you can eat them or distribute them. But yeah, I would like to see that um, develop. If, um, if you need help, you can email us too if you're hitting a, hitting a speed bump or need some ideas. Uh, I would probably be on CNN right now, right? Uh, <laughs> and maybe Fox News. Um, I don't know. You know, mushrooms can get viruses too. And um, I, I was uh, at a moment where someone asked me from the CDC if they could see or, and I asked if anybody would be willing to maybe possibly test our process using uh, COVID uh, active uh, virus uh, to see if mushrooms can produce antiviral compounds. That's a known, that's a known fact. Um, I wonder if they could handle respiratory viruses, which, you know, they don't have a respiration system like we do, but um, they produce compounds that they don't need, <laughs> uh, cancer fighting compounds, things like that. Um, so I, I really don't, I would be hopeful for it, um, but I've gone as far as talk to uh, someone at the CDC and then someone at the NIH who definitely wanted to have the discussion. Um, but I think that there's, there's just way pushing for vaccines like crazy. Um, mm -hmm. The vaccines might be way, way ahead of where we're at with our process. Um, the best thing I could offer to tell you is that, you know, I would, I would check out plants and medicinal herbs and plants and mushrooms that show antiviral activity and it can only help. Like I said, you can't overdose, you can't overdo it. Take uh, oyster mushrooms are really good. Um, shiitake and oyster mushrooms are widely available. They're easy to grow. They're, they're active against uh, retroviruses. Um, and um, I'll, I'll have to look into, I don't know if anybody's looked into coronaviruses. This is a whole new era, you know. A mushroom that eats plastic, right? Well, there are fungi that can break down polyurethane, but um, being a precursor, but there's really nothing that can take it. Uh, there's nothing that can be that, that same fungus cannot directly break down plastic. Uh, it might have to photodegrade um, or it might have to be heated. You know, there's, there's, there's some unknowns there. When they found uh, Pestilatopsis was one of the fungi that was breaking, they called it the plastic eating fungus. Well, it wasn't eating plastic. It was eating PUR 
which is a lab grade poly, uh, polyurethane. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't eating plastic, but you know the media. Um, I think it's hopeful. Um, probably the best place to look when I say, um, when I use the term build it and they will come, well, we've built it. All right. <laughs> we've <laughs> built waste, we've built landfills and the best place to look is the dumping grounds and dig into that and start looking for fungi. Now it's, it, you, you can't convince yourself that it's going to be a mushroom that you can see, you know, um, all the credit, uh, and focus has been on oh oyster mushrooms and these because I can see them I can pick them. There are one point, excuse me, five million fungi estimated to be on the planet, and most of them are going to be molds. So we might be dealing with mold collection, um, and these could be molds that are anaerobic, that are harvested from landfills, um, like anaerobic. Find them eating plastic. Um, you can find maybe harvest the plastic that's sitting out in those big Pacific. Uh, uh, dumping grounds that are just churning up in the Pacific. Somebody needs to go out there and start harvesting that and looking for water molds, um, molds in the landfill and seeing what is adhering. There's something, uh, if you build it, they will come. So bacteria are going to thrive and fungi are going to thrive. And ultimately I see it as a fungal and bacterial solution because they work together and uh, what we call uh, species sequencing. So fungi might be the first responder and the bacteria get involved and they help decompose it. Okay. So teamwork, right? On the microbial level. No, at the moment we're, we're closed. Um, and sadly, because we did a lot of tours, we really love uh, people stopping by, uh, the curious, uh, they come from all over the world and, um, it's hard to put that sign out there that says we're, you know, we just can't, um, deliveries only. Um, but, uh, that's kind of what we're up to with this Mushroom Mountain University is getting out there and being a, being a virtual resource. And, uh, I've tried to be online more <laughs> and, I'm not really on social media that much and I'm not going to tell you what kind of sandwich I'm eating and stuff like that. I'm only going to post when it's something major mm -hmm. um, or something interesting or cool that's happening around the farm. Um, so if you want to follow us and I usually send those to Chelsea and they try to retweet things out uh, for us. Um, but um, no, we do tours um, are, are not allowed yet or visitors. And we're trying to switch some of our workshops to online. So my hopes is, you know, this will turn the corner. And everybody's just got to do their part and hunker down, you know, what am I, I going to say? <laughs>